How's everyone doing tonight? Full House Adventure Lab in Tangent Hall. How many of you are here for the first time? Wow, okay, well, welcome. This is a special edition of Authors at Wharton that's always hosted by the McNulty Leadership Program and tonight in conjunction with Venture Lab in Tangent Hall. So I'm Lori Rosenkopf. I'm Wharton's Vice Dean of Entrepreneurship and also Wharton's Faculty Director for Venture Lab. So let me take one minute to tell you a little bit about this place. So many of you are new to us. We're the Entrepreneurship Center for all of Penn. We started in Wharton, but we now serve all of Penn being housed here in Tangent Hall. We serve students and alumni across the university, and we run programs for students who are interested in founding, joining, investing in, consulting to, or just exploring the world of startups. Let me give you some data, because we're Penn and we're data driven. We have over 3,000 members of Venture Lab. You can join very easily by going to our website. We have over 1,000 alumni who come through here and engage with students every year. On Twitter, we have over 40,000 followers. We have a flagship program called Venture Initiation Program, VIP, in the last five years. It's launched over 120 startups that collectively have raised over $500 million. We have nine unique labs and studios here, so please explore after the event. Hmm. And finally, this year, we're distributing over $1.2 million in non-dilutive funding. That's free money to student organizations, student ventures that are working with us. So let's talk about Authors at Warren. Today, we're very fortunate to host Reggie fils who is the former Mailed President and Chief Operating Officer of Nintendo of America. I'm so excited for you to hear Reggie's story because it reflects innovation, passion, and perseverance, which are all hallmarks of our Penn entrepreneurial community. I want to thank my longtime friend and colleague, Professor Adam Grant, who runs this entire wonderful series. I want to also thank the McNulty team, particularly Eden Zabala and Kate Fitzgerald for working on this event with our awesome Venture Lab team. Sebastian Jaramillo, Taylor Durham, Jay Khan, and our fantastic design studio students. So, let's get to the main event. Everyone, put your hands together and give a warm welcome to Reggie and to Adam. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Reggie, welcome to Authors at Word. And good to see you again. Well, we'll find out if that's true. <laughs> Uh-oh, now the tough questions begin. We'll, uh, we'll be bringing the pain all evening. Um, I want to start at your beginning, because I was trying to calculate the probability that you would be here in this room on this stage as the former president and CEO of Nintendo, and it was lower than I could count. So talk us through your background and, and how you arrived here. Sure. Well, look, first, uh, thanks for the opportunity to be on this campus uh, very little known fact, I was on this campus probably around 20 years ago with my uh, firstborn, my son. He was looking at going to school here at Warden. Uh, he didn't go. Uh, he was accepted, didn't go. Uh, he was also accepted to Cornell, where I went to school. Didn't go to that. Uh, he ended up going to Duke University. So I was, I was uh, crushed twice. Um, but look, my, my journey is uh, it's a classic immigrant's tale. A and by that I mean my parents emigrated to the United States to escape the brutal dictatorship in Haiti by Francois Duvalier. And um, my mother's side of the family was associated with the politics of the time. My maternal grandfather was essentially the Secretary of Health and Education in Haiti before the dictatorship. On my father's side, uh, my grandfather was associated with the military. The military always participated in the coups. So you know, it was a very interesting dynamic that my parents came from, but they had met in Haiti, they had uh, fallen in love there, they both came to the United States at different times, found each other again in the Bronx, New York, and that's where I was born and where, uh, where my life began. Uh, the Bronx uh, then and even now is a rough place. Uh, it used to hold the poorest congressional district in the United States. 
And when you think about that, I mean, you, you think about some, some really tough, downtrodden areas, that was the Bronx, New York. And so uh, that was the first eight years of my life, uh, five floor, walk up tenement building, um, a stabbing happened in the roof uh, above our apartment. Uh, we stumbled upon that on a Sunday morning. Um, so it was a rough beginning. Uh, but you know, like so many of you here as you know, first generation Americans, you know, my focus was education. And so I read the family encyclopedia when I was about three and a half, four years old. Um, I, I focused on education as a pathway. And that's what led me to Cornell. That's what led me to have you know, a lot of the traits that I'm sure here in this room, intellectual curiosity, uh, a focus on uh, really wanting to learn, not just for knowledge's sake, but really to try and understand how things work, hopefully to make them better. Um, that was my pathway. And, and you know, I was fortunate to get into Procter & Gamble's brand management program as an undergrad. So you know this this brown kid at, at uh, about 22 years old, working alongside people with MBAs, uh, you know people who were you know typically five or eight years older than I was, but doing the same work, uh, being paid less, uh, but doing the same work, uh, and that was the beginning of my trajectory. Always working uh, in fast-paced consumer goods. Uh, focusing on big challenges and, and luckily having good success out in the marketplace, which led me to Nintendo. What, what were your goals at that point? Did you have a vision of, I want to run what I think was the greatest video game company in human history? You know, when I, when I was graduating from Cornell, I believed that I had the capability to run a business. And that's what I knew. I'm going to run a business. I believed my pathway was going to be through finance. I was an undergraduate finance major, interned at banks. And I thought it was going to be, uh, you know, be at a bank for a couple of years, go get an MBA, then get into banking. I saw that as my journey. Uh, but I, I was uh, smart enough to recognize that life doesn't always go the way you plan. And so when I was offered this job with Procter & Gamble, which at the time, I didn't know much about the company, but the more I looked into it, the more I was excited. You know, this, at the time, probably a $5 billion, not quite yet global company that managed itself through these individual brands. So you would learn essentially how to run a small business with the backing of a big international company, but you would learn all the skills of marketing and advertising and promotion and finance and all of these key capabilities. So you know, this is the, the first little nugget that I'll leave for you as you think about your own personal journey. You know, your pathway isn't preordained. You need to be open to alternatives. You need to be open to alternative pathways that are gonna get you where you wanna to, want to go, but it's gonna be maybe a little bit different than what you initially think. And I was fortunate to, uh, to go through that alternate pathway at P&G. And yes, I did eventually run a business, uh, but it was, uh, it was a circuitous way in getting there. P&G has a long history of, um, I think, the kind of entrepreneurship you're talking about and catapulting people into innovative roles all over the place. What did you learn in those early days that served you well later? So I, I learned the importance of the customer, right? Uh, understanding the voice of the customer, the person who's going to buy the product, use the product, really understanding what their motivations are and thinking through how to better meet those needs was a, a critical learning from my P&G days. Uh, I learned a focus on data and information. I mean, I, I was essentially into big data and analytics before it was a thing in terms of the way I, I would spend time with our market research uh, to really try and understand the market, my brand's place in the market. Um, I learned to ask good questions. Um, 
questions of my peers as I was trying to navigate uh, this company as, uh, as still a very young man, uh, but also the ability to ask tough questions of people that, uh, that I worked with in terms of my bosses and my agency partners, because I, I believed in, in finding the truth, right? The truth about a business, the truth about how to push an organization forward, the truth about myself in terms of what motivated me to, uh, to drive forward. So those were some of the key things I learned. I learned how to manage people uh, at Procter & Gamble, which is, you know, as I think about my career, that's been a key hallmark for me, how to spot talent, grow talent, um, and have a group of individual doing things that they themselves never thought was possible. I want to talk about what you look for when you hire, but first, you, I think there was this incredible moment where I first became aware of you, uh, which we'll get to in a second. But I want to, I want to start a little bit before that, which is um, what happened when you first heard about this job opening at Nintendo and what was the interview process like? So, uh, you know, at, at this point, this is 2003. So let me, let me talk about first myself. You know, I, I had been at a range of different companies and a range of different industries, consumer packaged goods, restaurant industry uh, for a good six, seven years. Uh, I did a, a private equity backed venture. Uh, I worked in the beer and spirits business. So a variety of different industries. But personally, I started playing video games in the early 1990s just as a personal passion. You know, my very first system was a Super Nintendo Entertainment System. I probably had some 70 games for that system, 7-0. And just as a little aside, when I joined Nintendo and I asked the question, you know, on average, how many games did someone who owned that system have? And they told me it was like five or six, <laughs> right? So I was, I was a super user of the Super Nintendo system before I'd ever joined the company. So, you know, I had this background of uh, enjoying games, playing games. Uh, so the Super Nintendo, N64, there was a PlayStation 2 in my house, there was an original Xbox in my house. So from a consumer's perspective, I had a sense of the industry. I had a sense of the franchises. I had a sense of what made a good game and, and maybe not so good a game. Professionally, I was ready for a change. I was, uh, just before then, I spent time in the Viacom uh, group of companies working for the VH1 uh, media channel. And one of the things that I learned about myself is that I, you know, I need to be in charge. Um, in the media business, in the media business, the people who are in charge are the creatives, the people who are creating the content. Um, the marketers and the business people are kind of on the side. Uh, and I didn't like that very much. I, I didn't have a lot of fun. Uh, so when I get the recruiter phone call that Nintendo's looking for head of sales and marketing, that the position are, uh, for Nintendo of America, that the position is arguably the, the second most influ influential role within that subsidiary, you know, I reported to a president, and Nintendo of America was the largest subsidiary of global Nintendo, about 50% of the sales and profits. So now I start saying to myself, so you know, they need a guy with ideas, they need a person who's going to help build a team, they need someone who understands the video game business, at least from a consumer perspective, it checked all the boxes. So it, it was really, a, a, in many ways, a prototypical role for me, but Adam, you know, just like I said earlier, you know, life is full of, of alternatives. Uh, the job was in Seattle, Washington. All my family's on the East Coast. Uh, again, it was kind of you know, media ancillary business, so I wasn't sure if I would really be in charge and really be able to drive change. I had other opportunities on the East Coast uh, that I thought might be more meaningful, so I took a risk. You know, I, I said, you know, this thing sounds interesting. I think I could add a lot and I decided to, uh, to make that pivot. Um, one more small story. So, you know, so I make this pivot uh, and, and I recognize that I really need to make sure that I'm successful in the role. So I did something really provocative. Uh, I, I asked to have a video conference 
with the global head of Nintendo. And I heard years later that, that at the time, this caused all kinds of you know, ramifications and dis discussion back at the global Nintendo headquarters. You know, from their perspective, you know, who's this brash American asking to speak to the global president? But what I said then and, and later, as I heard about some of this feedback, I said, look, what I recognized is in order to be successful in the role, I needed to be able to partner with the senior most leadership in the company. I needed to make sure that we could work together. We needed to make sure that you know, I would understand at least his initial vision and that I would have opportunities to help shape that vision uh, in ways to make it even more effective. Um, so that was the process. I, I love that lesson of asking to speak to somebody that you have no business talking to because it, it's clearly set you up, right, in a relationship where you had influence and it also was a real test of the culture to figure it, out if they can handle it. It, it, was, uh, it was a real test. And, you know, I, I'd love to say in hindsight that, oh, this was perfectly planned. I knew exactly what I was doing. Um, but the, the truth is, as I said earlier, the thing that I realized is that I wanted to be successful in the role, and I recognized that I needed to have partnership with the key executives who understood the business, had been in the business for a long time, and really were working to shape the overall vision and strategy for the company. Because otherwise, I would've been back in that VH1 job. I would've been just sitting on the sidelines not having the influence that I wanted to have. So I feel like we need to ask the audience a question at this point, which is, uh, how many of you are gamers, first of all? Okay, and those of you who are, just pick your favorite video game system. Um, can you show us the number of games you have by holding up your fingers? Uh, on that system? Yeah, on your favorite system. Okay, some of you are counting in the multiples of 10. Good to know. All right, so Reggie, you're not alone in this room. Um, I'm, I'm a little disappointed, though, that you didn't start until the 90s in Super Nintendo, because I'm a little bit behind you career-wise, and I started in the 80s on original Nintendo, 8-bit. Well, so, well, what were you waiting for? Yeah, so, look, I, uh, you know, I played all of the early generation games, right? So the Atari, Commodore, I played that stuff. Uh, in college, I was uh, at college in the late 70s, early 80s. I played a lot of pinball, a lot of arcade games. And then, you know, as I start my career, I didn't have time to game. Um, excuses. Uh, lots of excuses, <laughs> lots of excuses. But look, I, I, uh, I certainly made up for it later on. Did you have a favorite Super Nintendo game? Yes. What? Okay, I'm gonna guess. I'm thinking Mario Kart or Donkey Kong? No, no to both. Okay, how about NBA Jam or Madden? No, no, no. All right, I give up. Uh, favorite? I just gave you my favorites. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, we're going to get back to that. Um, so my favorite game on the SNES system, uh, Legend of Zelda Link to the Past. Uh, passionate, passionate <laughs> Zelda player. I've played every game. You know, like all of, well, not all of you, may, maybe some of you, I'm looking forward to the next Zelda game that's going to launch uh, next year. So I've picked uh, Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild back up and I'm playing Wait, that. You haven't beaten Breath of the Wild yet? I beat it, come on. I'm, <laughs> I, I've, I'm, at, uh, I'm now at about 89% completion of, of the entire game, right? So there's a way you could see if you've 100% of the game. Yeah. So um, I'm short about 100 Korok seeds for those of you who know the game. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm working hard. Okay, full disclosure, um, I've been playing it with our nine-year-old, and I keep saying no because I'm afraid I'm gonna get sucked into it, and then that's all I'll do. So thank you for that. Yes, yes. Well, um, you know, so here, I'm, I'm gonna interject with a, with a little story of the first time I met Adam. So uh, Adam, you, uh -oh. you, you, had, you had just uh, published uh, Give and Take, and you were speaking at an event uh, that I attended, a, a group of about 40 to 50 uh, global executives, either at the president level or uh, subsidiary head, what have you. And uh, you spoke and, and talked about some of the key principles from that book, which is one of my, my favorite books. Um, and somehow we were seated together, we proceeded to spend time together, 
and you shared your passion for gaming and Nintendo in particular. And you know, at, at age what seven years old, you were you were a Nintendo champion, or something close to it. I uh, I admit to nothing. <laughs> I, I know that my mom was threatening to freeze dry me when I played Nintendo, um, particularly Metroid. Um, and it, uh, another another great franchise. Yes, a classic. Um, I, I I remember no one else from that event. I remember nothing I said. Oh my God, Reggie's here. <laughs> okay, so when I first became aware of you was when you had a very public moment that I think was fairly out of character from what I know about your personality and maybe your comfort zone. Can you, some people in the room probably know the story and watched it live, others have no idea. Can you tell us the story as you lived it? Sure, so you know, again, 2003, I joined the company as head of sales and marketing for Nintendo of America. So Nintendo's main home console system was the GameCube, also known as the Purple Purse uh, during its time. Um, uh, a, a, a powerful system, arguably the most powerful system of its generation, but it was playing a game straight up against its key competitors in PS2 and the original Xbox. And so from a global perspective, the system was third out of three in terms of global sales. Um, so not doing well. On the handheld side, the, the company was having tremendous success with the Game Boy, uh, at the time the Game Boy Advance. But at the E3 prior, E3 is the big gaming industry conference held in the May-June timeframe. In the year prior, uh, Sony had announced that they were going to enter the handheld market with the PlayStation Portable. And that's all they said, I'm gonna enter it, here's the name, didn't show the prototype, didn't talk about games. Nintendo took about a 15% haircut in its stock price with that announcement. So that's what I was walking into. And so uh, my first trip to Kyoto to see the products we had, they showed me the beginnings of what would become the Nintendo DS a system that went on to sell over 150 million devices, uh, sell uh, about 950 million pieces of software, and software is where the money's made. And so, you know, a tremendous innovation. We talked about some of the key products that we were gonna launch, how we were going to target all types of game players and bring new game players into the industry. Uh, they also showed me the very uh, first uh, elements for the next Zelda game, which would be, uh, it would become Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess. So I knew we had a lot of innovation to share at the upcoming E3, which was about five months after I had joined the company. And that began, that began a process where we wanted to change the conversation of how people were thinking about Nintendo. We wanted to reinforce the innovation story we had. We wanted to, to stake a claim that we make great games, that these, you know, our competitors will talk about all other things, but we make great content. And that's what should matter in this industry. So it was gonna be a very competitive stance and a very aggressive stance. And as the new, newly minted head of sales and marketing, I was gonna be the one delivering a lot of this messaging uh, to change the narrative for the company. So we began the process to create the script. Uh, I, I worked with a very dear friend, a gentleman by the name of Don Varyu, to craft this speech and to craft the opening. And working together, we came up with this, uh, this opening line, which was, my name is Reggie, I'm about kicking ass, I'm about taking names, and we're about making games. To immediately set the tone, to immediately make it, uh, make it known out there in the marketplace to our business partners, our fans, that this was going to be a new age. Uh, and luckily, again, we had the goods to deliver on those bold, brash statements. We had this, this brand new platform that we showcased, we had the Legend of Zelda trailer that literally made game critics cry out in the audience. Um, and so that was my introduction to 
the gaming media, the gaming fans, the industry with that statement. And you know, you, you say, you know, as you know me, you know, maybe it's, it's not me. It is 100% me in the competitive nature, right? Of saying, you know, we're gonna plant a flag, this is what we're gonna do, and here's how we're going to reshape this industry on terms that we can be successful. And that's the important thing, right? You know, at, for all of you, as you think about business innovation and reshaping industries, you need to reshape it in a way that you're gonna win based on your own capabilities, your core competencies, and that's what we were able to do. If I remember correctly, you, you had a couple of hesitations though, one of which was you may not be the most extroverted person on earth, and so this, there's a little bit of a stretch, right, to come out that bold. And the other is you're making a hell of a promise, which if you don't deliver on, um, I think it's probably gonna kick your ass, is right. a fair way to right. say it. Um, so how did you navigate that this was the right risk to take for you and the company? It, it was uh, it was through a lot of uh, review of our content, the review of you know, what was going to be our pipeline of innovation. Uh, I also have to say that with Nintendo in third place at the time, I didn't think it was going to be this industry defining moment. Um, or certainly a defining moment for me. It, it really was against the business objective that we needed to change the narrative. We needed to be clear in our focus on doing things differently in order to be effective out in the marketplace. So yes, in hindsight, I can, I can look and say, wow, it really was a high risk, uh, a high risk position to take. But the fact of the matter was, it was exactly what the company needed to, uh, to essentially begin the process of changing all of the past opinions and reinforcing that this is a highly innovative company that's going to disrupt the marketplace again and again and again. When you tell a story that way, it seems like you had nothing to lose. Like you're not gonna become fourth of three. Well, I, the, the company did not have a lot to lose, right? Yeah, the, 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 the new head of sales and marketing is fresh meat out there, right? They don't know him. Um, if we don't deliver, you know, kind of lesson learned, you, you pivot and go forward. But I have to say, Adam, at the time, we believed that our strategy, our strategy to make gaming systems more approachable, to create content across a wide collection of players versus you know, the prototypical, you know, male 16-year-old gamer that the, the industry was really defining itself against at the time, we believe that we could bring a range of content and a range of innovation that would play to our strengths. And so it, it really was a bet that we knew better than our competition what the industry needed. So you then rise up, obviously, and you're running the show in a bigger way. Um, what, were, what were the pivotal choice moments where you had to sort of say, like that, okay, there's a fork in the road. Um, am I going all in here? Am I gonna hedge my bets? Uh, which ones mattered? You know, um, I, I highlight a number of these in the book. The, the, the ones that I would focus on uh, in, in terms of, you know, let me call it breakthrough moments where I had to push and gain agreement uh, in order to execute an idea that changed your trajectory, I, I would highlight three of them. First, for the Nintendo DS, as we're trying to reshape the definition of a player, there was a game that had been launched in Japan that was highly successful. It was called Brain Age. This game concept leveraged work by a Japanese neuroscientist who had identified that, that small bursts of activity, whether it's reading, math, uh, these short bursts of activity stimulate your brain um, and they just, they help keep you uh, fresh. They, they help, um, you know, they, they, they made some health claims in the Japanese market um, in terms of, you know, improving your memory and things of that nature. We couldn't do any of that. Uh, here in the United States, because uh, in order to make those claims, you need 
studies that last for years. And this was a game that we're you know, trying to figure out how to launch. Uh, but this game was massively successful in the Japanese market. Uh, and it was consumers over 50 who were buying and, and playing this content. They had the benefit of leveraging this well-known neuroscientist. So now I'm being challenged. I need to launch the game here in the Americas and have it be just as successful. But this individual had no equity in our marketplace. And so I needed to find a different way to have equity and credibility. At the time, the number puzzle Sudoku was just gaining in popularity. And uh, there were similar claims being made that playing Sudoku helped your brain and, and, and all of this. So I pitched the developers in Japan that we need to include Sudoku in the West. And the pushback was immediate. Reggie, you know, uh, the, the neuroscientist's name was Kawashima. Dr. Kawashima did not do tests with Sudoku. Um, so therefore, we can't include it. Uh, you know, to program it into the game would be too difficult, so we can't include it. All of these objections, which I proceeded to overcome one by one by one, because I knew that we needed something, some sort of hook, in order for the game to be successful. And in the end, Sudoku was exactly that hook. We pitched the idea to, to Dr. Kawashima. He accepted. He thought it was great. It, he said it was consistent with all of his learnings. Um, that was probably my first big win. Um, and, and I was able to do that uh, before I became president of Nintendo of America. Second key win that I would highlight was the advertising for the Wii. Right? So you all remember the Wii, one-handed uh, remote. Uh, you could play tennis by waving the remote. You could do bowling. There were a lot of broken glass somewhere still in our carpet case. <laughs> uh, and so you know, we, we wanted to communicate you know, the, the range of players and how much fun it was. So we created this advertising, killer advertising. And from my, my experience at P&G, I knew that you know, great advertising is how you build great brands and great businesses. So this advertising was key to what we wanted to do. Uh, I had shared the advertising uh, internally with the senior leadership in Japan. Initially, they were fine. But we are now weeks before launching the campaign, and I get a call at home from the global president, a gentleman by the name of Satoru Wada. He says, Reggie, I've been sharing the advertising with people here in Kyoto, and there are some concerns. Uh, and he, wanted, he proceeded to list you know, a variety of different concerns, concerns that would not show up in our marketplace. Things like, you know, in Japanese culture, you know, the, the two protagonists in the commercials would not be this familiar with these families, all of these objections that really weren't relevant for our marketplace. Um, and, you know, I played a card that you really can't play all that often. Uh, I had been recently promoted, and I said, Mr. Iwata, you just promoted me. You obviously believe in my skills and my capabilities. I am telling you this advertising is breakthrough. And if you have me make the changes that you want, it won't be. It'll be pablum. And so I need you to trust me that this is gonna work and that it will move the marketplace forward and that it won't have a detrimental effect on the Japanese home market where you've raised all these concerns. And there was a pause. Because in the Japanese culture, right, they, they need to think and to process. Unlike the West, we process by talking. They process by being silent. And I Sometimes gave- we just talk. No processing. And so you know, I gave him time to really consider what I had said. And you know, after what felt like you know, 10 minutes, but was probably no more than 10 seconds, he said, Reggie, go ahead. I trust you. And that advertising really was a key part of the success of the platform. Um, I just want to call out for a second the way that you set the stage for what psychologists call self-persuasion, which is you didn't tell him that you had the answer. right? You let him convince himself um, and made it really easy for him to say, well, why did I promote Reggie? I must trust him, and therefore I've got to follow his advice. Yeah. The, um, you know, the third 
um, example that I would use in, in terms of uh, you know, really pushing on ideas. This is another uh, example from the Wii generation. So if, if you played the Wii, you played Wii Sports. Wii Sports was created by you know, some of the top developers at Nintendo. And again, as I said earlier, the way we make money is by selling software, selling millions of copies of software. And we knew we would sell millions of copies of Wii Sports. But I had a different idea. You know, one of the things that I thought would be critical to our long-term success with the platform was, was having this cultural moment, this, this FOMO moment with the system that defined uh, the gameplay, it defined who we were going after from a target standpoint, and we Sports was that software. It defined everything that we were trying to do. And so I pushed for Wii Sports to be included as part of the overall Wii proposition, for it to be packed in, essentially free, as, uh, as part of the overall proposition. And so imagine, you know, newly promoted Reggie fils having a conversation with Shigeru Miyamoto, arguably the world's best game developer, trying to convince him that this game that he knew was killer needed to be given away free as part of the, the overall proposition. Convincing him and his team took months. Months. You know, he came back with a different idea. Reggie, let me show you some different games. Let's include this. And I was like, no, Mr. Miyamoto, this doesn't do what we need it to do. It, it, it's not the collection of games uh, that's, that's similar to Wii Sports. What he ended up showing me was a game that we built out as uh, Wii Play. So a collection of mini games, and we actually packed it in with a controller, which is a different story of persuasion. Um, but, uh, but that decision of including Wii Sports in the overall proposition defined the success of that platform. And you can see it because for as good of a persuader that I am, I didn't convince them to take this approach in the Japanese home market. So in the Japanese home market, they sold the software. Wow, you have a natural experiment. So it was a natural experiment, an A-B test, where the rest of the world, it's included. And you're seeing this phenomenon of Wii Sports being played in bars in London. You see Wii Sports being played on cruise ships. You see Wii Sports being played in retirement homes. You're seeing all of this cultural, um, you know, magical moments around this software, and you didn't see it nearly to the same extent uh, in the Japanese market. And it was all because of that, that one persuasive decision. That's incredible. Okay, this is a perfect segue to the lightning round. Are you ready for this? Yes. Okay, aiming for a word to a sentence. Um, you can pass if you want. I don't think you'll need to. But um, that was, a, I think, a great move of you demonstrating what it looks like to lead like a giver and say, we're going we're gonna to take this thing that we could profit from. We're going to give it away with no strings attached. And we think in the long run, that's going to help people learn the platform. It's going to build loyalty. Um, my question to start the lightning round is, um, how do you gauge whether someone is a giver or a taker? Do you have a favorite interview tip? If you were, say, interviewing anybody in this room? I, I, I ask what their motivation is. Meaning, you know, why, why do you want this job? Why, why do you want to do? Uh, and if you hear a lot of I's versus we's, to me that's a tip off of someone who is more self-centered versus thinking a bit more globally about the organization, the enterprise. Okay, next question. What's the worst career advice you've ever gotten? Worst career advice, and a number of people told me this, was not to take the Nintendo job. Okay, we need an elaboration on that. Yeah, so, you know, again, yeah, Nintendo's in third place. Parent is a Japanese company. Uh, you know, reputation of Japanese companies isn't great in terms of their style of management. Uh, West Coast, outside of Seattle, all my family's on the East Coast. All of my friends, people that I trust and I continue to trust. Every, everyone can make a bad decision once in a while. Um, but all of these people were telling me, don't take the job. 
And I, I, I had had a string of, you know, kind of two to three year jobs. So I needed to have a role that had tenure and long-term success. And so I was given the advice not to take the Nintendo job by a number of people. Luckily, I didn't listen. Very glad about that. Um, will you have a role in the upcoming Mario movie? <laughs> to, to my knowledge, no. They, you know, they haven't taken my voice and you know, come to me with some sort of release, but to my knowledge, I am not in the movie. Possibly apocryphal, Mario <laughs> or Luigi? I gotta go with Luigi, the younger brother. I'm a younger brother uh, in a family of two, so Luigi. Respect. Uh, favorite character in the Nintendo ecosystem? Link. Yeah, predictable. Okay. Predictable. If you were gonna do a crossover with another universe, what would you pick? Tom Marvel. Um, you know, so the reason I hesitate is uh, you know, during my tenure, the way Smash Brothers has evolved as a franchise, to literally have just about every key video game character involved, either as a playable character or as a badge or you know, music, uh, I, I think the developer on that, on that uh, series, uh, Mr. Sakurai, has done a fabulous job. So I, I think the world's best gaming crossover has already been done at Smash Brothers. Interesting, very on brand. Um, question on behalf of my kids, uh, and I'm sure you don't want to weigh in on current or future Nintendo strategy, but I, I think you can thread the needle on this one. Uh, we love playing Mario Kart uh, with our family across the country and sometimes around the world. And it basically got us through COVID. But only two people can play at the same time on a given system. So there are five of us. Um, if we're playing remotely, only two of us can get in. If I wanted to change that, how would I get that idea across to Nintendo? Yeah, so... Um, Do I have to buy multiple systems? Is that what you're going to tell me? I'm hoping that. No. I, you know, th th this is the kind of thing that the company is acutely aware of. Um, and, you know... So Mario Kart 8, the current Mario Kart, was developed essentially for the Wii U platform. Right? That, Wii, that platform, I think its anniversary is coming up pretty soon, like a 10-year anniversary. So it's, it's kind of legacy. And so I am certain that the company's working on Mario Kart 9, and I'm sure they're saying to themselves, you know, how do we make this, you know, I'll use the words massively multiplayer, but you know, essentially enabling more people to play because the company knows you know, that is a key element of that game. I think you uh, now, made, now, you made it, a few days in this room. Yeah, so you know, don't don't start tweeting. Reggie just announced Mario Kart 9. <laughs> That's not what I did. Uh, but you know, the, the company is fully aware of the, the current limitations of that execution. Okay. Well, when it happens, I have a group of people who are Mario Kart super fans who are ready to join. So we're going to organize a game. There you go. Are you in? I'm in. The, I, Mar I, I'm not all that great at Mario Kart. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Are you self-handicapping right now? Uh, I'm, not, gonna I, I, I'm, not, I'm not going to ask for a handicap. I'm just stating facts. There are, there are Nintendo games as well as other platforms that I'm much more effective at. Okay, well, for the record, as we do these kinds of conversations, I've been collecting people, interesting people who love the game. And on the Mario Kart list so far, we have John Green, Ronan Farrow, John Batiste, and I have not found a woman yet. But if you can help build that list out. Oh, uh, absolutely. Love to. Absolutely. Um, okay, to be continued on that front. Uh, leaving the lightning round, um, we're gonna, we have a bunch of student questions that were submitted. I've asked a few of them already. Uh, but one other thing I wanted to, um, to ask you about that really surprised me recently is I posted about some evidence that video games are, have a bunch of cognitive benefits for kids as well as adults. And some parents freaked out. And I was completely unprepared for this because I thought we had moved on. Like my, my mom was you know, upset about video games. I thought this generation's parents thought you know, screens were evil from a social media standpoint. Like, we got that video games are more active than you know, TV and movies, and like, of course addiction can be a problem, but it only affects about 3% of the population, and I think they're net positive from all the data I've read, and I'm not at all biased, of course. <laughs> um, you've dealt with a lot of this. How have you navigated those conversations, and how can maybe some of the folks in the room who are still trying to convince their parents that video games are not the devil uh, better approach them? So, uh, a, a couple of things. First, the, my, my original book proposal, my, 
My, my very first book idea was you know, the real life skills you can learn from video games. Because there are a significant number. You know, in, in terms of uh, strategy, there are a number of great strategy games out there. Um, you know, certainly hand-eye coordination. You know, I, I've been told by parents uh, the role that Pokemon played for early reading skills. So the, the fact is, you know, there are critical skills that you can learn from playing video games. You didn't even mention grit and resilience. That's where I learned those skills. Right? The number of times that I lost and threw the control and then, oh, I need to figure and, and, out how to. Exactly, pick it back up and start again. And, and so, um, you know, as a parent that raised three kids, you know, playing video games, you know, I, I, I think the, the key message that I would always deliver, right? So I would highlight the positive, right? Here are all these games. Here's what you could learn by playing these games. But the role of parent um, is you need to set limits. Because the fact of the matter is doing any one thing for extended periods of time is not good for you. You know, I, a number of my uh, friends, uh, parents, you know, they're all about their kids and physical sports. And it's, it's one sport to the next to the next, or what's, what I believe is even worse, you know, taking a child fairly young, you know, five, six, seven years old, and proclaiming, oh, you're gonna be great in basketball, or you're gonna be great in baseball, or you're gonna be great in football, and not give the child an opportunity to do anything else. And so it's all about moderation. It's all about setting limits and being smart in how you encourage your child to have a full range of, of experiences, physical experiences, virtual experiences. You know, that's how we learn. That's, that's how we, uh, we test ourselves, we test our limits. And so that to me is the key message. Video games, you know, just like real physical games, you know, absolutely are good for you, as long as they're done in moderation. Eminently reasonable. Um, I will be quoting you later tonight. <laughs> as, as you play or as you enable your children to play? Oh, uh, but I also have to call my mom now. <laughs> um, okay, so we've got a, a few questions I haven't gotten to yet. Um, I think some of them are very Nintendo specific, some are gaming general, and some are kind of leadership, life, innovation, entrepreneurship, career, etc. cetera. Uh, so I'll try to do a, a bit of a mix. Uh, one that I, I thought was really interesting is uh, how do you think about storytelling? Uh, it's something you do a lot as a leader. Do you have a model, a framework, an approach you can recommend to all of us? Yeah, I, I, as a leader, you get a lot of practice storytelling because the way you build cultures, the way you teach important lessons is through storytelling. I, I, I believe what's important in telling a great story, first, you gotta put things in context. Right? Everything has context. So what's the context um, in the story you're telling and the question you've been asked? Um, second, I believe that great stories have relevance to the audience you're delivering them to, but have an unexpected twist. They, they, they have some uniqueness. Otherwise, it's not memorable. Right? Otherwise, it's, it's not worth repeating. And so... You know, as I focus on stories, you know, the stories I tell in the book, the stories I tell in a boardroom in terms of how to help today's executives navigate big challenges, you know, I, I make sure that there's enough background and perspective on the story. I, I make sure that what I'm saying is relevant and has the unexpected twist that hopefully is applicable to, uh, to the, the current situation. And the other thing is, you know, candidly, I make sure that it's worth sharing. You know, I am not the type of person that walks into a room and immediately is trying to dominate the conversation. I do a lot of listening, but I believe that you know, when I'm going to tell a story, when I'm going to share something, it needs to be on point, it needs to be relevant to what it is that we're discussing and hopefully uh, meaningful and memorable to the audience that's hearing it. Great, another career question that looked to be quite popular is, uh, early in your career, did you have issues with being taken seriously? Uh, and if so, how did you build credibility? Yeah, I, I wouldn't frame it as being taken seriously. But as I said earlier, I was typically the youngest person in the room. 
I was typically the person with the least overall business, business experience. I, I, had, I had done an internship uh, in between my sophomore and junior year and then junior and senior year. So I, I, I had you know, some, some number of weeks in a professional environment uh, you know, working alongside you know, 28 year old minted MBA. So what I needed to convince myself of is, you know, I'm here for a reason, right? I, obviously, I've communicated, uh, you know, my my benefits, my unique perspective, why I add value, uh, and I, I needed to make sure that I focused on opportunities to interject and to make a difference. So you know that was my challenge. It wasn't you know, it, you know not taking Reggie seriously. It was you know I, I was listening a lot in those early meetings and finding the opportunity to interject, to hopefully say something smart, uh, and make a positive impact, so that people would you know would walk away from that interaction saying you know this person is pretty sharp, uh, and maybe you know doesn't maybe he's not the most polished person. Uh, maybe you know he doesn't have the world's greatest amount of experience, but what this person is bringing is a very provocative, unique, compelling point of view. There are some people here with us who apparently want to dredge up your biggest regrets. So there, there are two questions on this. One is, if you could change one thing in your life so far, what moment or decision would it be? Yeah. So I'm I'm going to say something that maybe isn't. Popular, you know, I, I don't have truly any regrets. That's different than you know. I've made a lot of mistakes, and and, and let me share with you what I see as the difference. So, I'm uh, I'm an executive at Procter and Gamble. I'm working on a business that has a huge number of challenges. Uh, this is in the late 80s. I'm working uh, on the brand Crisco Shortening. You know, for those of you who, who remember what that product was, essentially shortening was uh, a cooking fat, solid fat. You would use it for baking, you'd use it for frying. A declining category um, in, as health consciousness was beginning, uh, but highly profitable for the company because it's being made on machines that have been paid for a long time ago so every can we sell is like pure profit. I had worked on this brand earlier in my career, so I, I understood the business incredibly well. I, I was moved onto the business as a senior brand manager, and you know, we immediately worked to create great advertising, um, some great marketing plans, uh, but we didn't have the full marketing budget to pull all those together and launch them in the marketplace. So I did the one thing that you're taught as a person coming into Procter & Gamble. The one thing you're told right off the bat is you will not overspend your budget. You will not overspend your budget. But here I was, I saw all of these ideas, but I didn't have the full marketing budget to pay for it. So I did the math. I, you know, I, I tumbled out if we're able to grow the business over this time that I could spend the money and recoup it in profitability before there was an issue. And that's exactly what I did. I spent the money. The payback happened a little bit longer than I had modeled out. And so now I'm being called on the carpet because I'd overspent my budget. And my career effectively was done at Procter & Gamble with that decision. Now, some people who think in terms of regrets would say, boy, you know, I really regret that decision. But I don't. I don't regret the decision. And, and it's because you know, it reinforced for me things about my business approach. I tend to take risks, typically prudent risks, but I am, I am not risk averse. I like fast growing businesses. And at Procter & Gamble, businesses would grow about 3% a year, Couple points in cost savings. You grow your profitability by five points. You're a hero. I don't like those types of businesses. Those are too slow, slow moving for me. So I, I learned this about myself, um, and it it also reinforced that I'd like to blow things up, disrupt them, and drive aggressive paths of growth. 
And so that experience, while it was incredibly painful at the time, really reinforced all of those things about me that I now value and have, you know, have uh, you know, helped me be the, the business executive that I am. So that, that to me is the difference between you know, understanding mistakes and really having regrets. Well, you and Dax are gonna have to fight for presidency of the No Regrets fan club based on that. <laughs> um, in the last couple minutes, let's, uh, let's see if we can squeeze in a few more in rapid fire. So the other regret question is, is there something you missed most from Nintendo? I missed the free games. <laughs> the free games and the free systems. And is there something that makes you glad you retired? You know, these types of opportunities. I mean, you know, leading, you know, a multi-billion dollar company, uh, my ability to interact with students, my ability to spend time in the boardrooms of other companies, these are the things that I get to do now in my retired life. And I would not give any of that up for anything. You know, to me, this is, this is my opportunity to enrich, empower uh, the next generation of business leaders. And that for me is a huge thrill. Best piece of advice you ever got? You know, best piece of advice I ever received was that you know, while each of us can you know, achieve things, when you are struggling, you need to ask for help. I was the type, you know, I would just power through on my own. You know, I, I figured it was up to me. You know, again, you, know, you, you think of the, the way I grew up, uh, you know, in a, in a very, um, you know, poor household. Um, it was all up to me. And learning how to ask for help uh, was a critical piece of learning. We got some questions about Web3 and gaming. Um, I'm not going to ask you anything about the artist formerly known as SBF. <laughs> but um, do you have a, a soundbite on digital gaming platforms, NFTs, uh, and where we're headed? Yeah, so I, I've, I've already made public comments. I, I, I believe blockchain as foundational technology is really interesting. Um, and, and I think there are opportunities to make entertainment, so not even just gaming, but make entertainment using that foundational technology. In the end, it has to be fun. Um, it, it needs to be entertaining for the player, can gouge them from a pricing standpoint. Uh, but I believe the underlying technology is really interesting. Um, I've always been skeptical of crypto as a currency because you know, I, I find it tough to buy into uh, a concept that someone says is valuable but has no underlying value. That's really tough for me. You clearly never collected baseball cards as a kid. <laughs> well, but they have value. I mean, e even if it was a beat up Mickey Mantle card to you that had value. Now, if you had kept it pristine, it would have even a lot more value. Uh, another, another question I think is, is extremely important to you, and I know it's a big priority now in your post-retirement life, is how do you make room for new artists in the gaming space, uh, particularly people who might be underrepresented? Yeah, so the beautiful thing about gaming is with the plethora of development tools, you know, if you want to get into gaming, you know, make, make content. Uh, and I, I do believe there are a variety of avenues for young creators to expose their content. Um, one of the companies I advise is uh, called uh, Rogue, Rogue Company, not Rogue, the esports team. Uh, this is a developer and publisher of games. And we did, uh, we did a, a series, a video series, uh, that was essentially highlighting young developers and their content. Um, and the winning game got a, um, a publishing contract from Rogue. Um, really interesting uh, experience. Uh, but the key in this is there are ways for you to publish content and get eyes on your content uh, today that really didn't exist even five years ago. So, you know, if you're a creator, underrepresented or overrepresented, the, the key is make content. Um, share that content. There are a number of gaming events, 
uh, where you can meet with uh, publishers and other people in the industry, show them the content, um, and, uh, and that's the way really to get eyes on it, to make it better, um, and hopefully create something that, uh, that could be spectacular. Wordle, right, not a traditional video game. Wordle was created by two people. Uh, you know, there, there are a host of games that have been created by small teams or individual creators. Um, it's, just, uh, it's just sharing that content. Do you have a parting piece of career life advice? Yeah, I, I would just re reinforce the point I made earlier. Be open to alternatives. Um, you know, I was, I was joking with Adam, you know, I, I spent a lot of time at another Ivy League institution, the one I happened to graduate from, um, and I go back there a lot and I'm constantly struck by you know, these young people, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old, who, who believe their path is set, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this, this is what I'm gonna do. And I just tell them, look, pause. Just be open that maybe you're gonna do something else. That maybe instead of you know, getting into investment banking, maybe you're gonna do something else. Just be open to that potential. And with that mindset, follow your passion. You know, find things that you're really interested in. Find ways where you want to make a difference. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm always concerned when I hear from young people, this will be my path. You know, I don't know my path, you know, and I'm 61 years old. I don't know what's next for me. Um, be open to alternatives. Well, Reggie, your book is about disrupting the game, but for me, you saved the game. And I think it's been so fun to have you here. Uh, we look forward to future wisdom anytime you want to stop by and you know, sort of ignore Cornell. But <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.